everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Extension educators from around Oklahoma spent some time in Stillwater this week, all to gain some insight in their program areas, be it agriculture, 4-H, or family and consumer sciences, information that they can bring home to address local county issues. You know, it's important because it gives me the opportunity to network with other other uh, educators in the, in the state that I don't get to see all the time, see what kind of programs they're doing, what's been successful, what hasn't been. Um, it's just a time to, to also uh, get some professional development for me, just kind of recharge my batteries um, on, on some ideas and, and new uh, tactics that I can take to, to, to impact my county back home. We'll continue our conversation about extension, including what the future holds for programming a little later in the show. But first, we're off to Bryan County and the story of the 4-H'er who has quite a unique livestock exhibit that can be a bit temperamental. But as Curtis Hare will show us, the rewards can be quite sweet. Near the banks of the Red River, 4-H'er Dory Brazier lives with her family on a small farm in Bryan County. Along with her sister, Riley, Dory raises show goats and a variety of animals. It seems like your typical Oklahoma farm with typical animals. But Dory is also raising some unconventional livestock that can deliver more of a sting than a kick. Me and my family really, really like honey. And we decided one day that we got tired of having to go look for honey everywhere to find, you know, honey that was made around here. So we decided that we'd go buy a couple of hives. We started in 2013, I guess, with a couple of hives we bought the first year. Um, I kept up with it, but really Dory kind of took it over and she's really been the, the spearhead on it. My favorite thing about bees is probably how they're like, they have this hair. It's like fuzz on them, but it's teeny tiny. Riley, what's your favorite thing about bees? I like honey. I like honey. <laughs> Dory's interest in bees flourished. She is now managing nine hives, totaling about 250,000 bees. She's become somewhat of the beekeeper of Bryan County. If there is a hive on your property, you call Dory. We have rescued a couple of hives this past summer, um, just a few miles from our house. One of them was at the sod farm on the back of a sod truck, and we, me and my dad, we had to go rescue the bees. Bees, whether they're wild bees or domesticated bees, I guess, whether they're in a tree or in a box, they will outgrow their hive that they're in and they'll split off and part of them will go find a new home with a new queen. That's usually when we start getting phone calls of people having a swarm on the side of their house or on a tree in their yard. While she's helping her community, Dory is playing a role in a solution to a bigger problem. The bees are endangered. They're, they're really getting scarce. They're getting, it's getting harder and harder to raise them. Um, and between Dory and Riley, both the girls have really recognized that there is a need for bees. The population of bees across the world have been decreasing, and hives such as these have been popping up to help combat the issue. Bryan County Extension educator Robert Bourne says it's awesome to see the younger generation step up and pitch in. It's really refreshing to see those folks that are, want to uh, bring their kids up and, and learning about the, the natural resources that we have here on, the, on Earth. Dory brought her passion for these insects to 4-H. Last summer, she was named the state record book winner in agriculture and natural resources for her work with bees. 4-H has taught me a lot of things about friendship and how um, having friends to help you, you know, on your projects and just being there for you is a, is a great way to grow up. I think Dory is a great role model. She, um, she wants to take on leadership roles and, and help out with the county. Uh, she's always there to um, be a, a bright shining star to those younger kids and, and they look up to Dory. It was something fun for my wife and I to kind of get started in, but since the girls have really taken it over, it uh, makes me really proud to see them put so much passion into something that they, that they believe in. And, in Bryan County, I'm Curtis Hare. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet weather report. It just isn't fair across Oklahoma. The eastern side of the state, they received rainfall early this week. The western side of the state, 
they're getting close to three months with no rains above a quarter inch. Out west, Kenton was up to 103 days as of Wednesday with no rains of over a quarter inch of rainfall. Taking a look at three-day rainfall Monday, Tuesday, and through Wednesday of this week, we see the eastern side of the state with some areas that were uh, up close to an inch, 7,500, 7,600 inches of rain. Out west, completely blank, uh, no rain out there at all. We have to go out 30 days to see some good rains over in the eastern side of the state where we had more than an inch of rain. Those are the green areas. And then down in the southeast, uh, some rains there over five inches. But again, as you look out west, very low rainfall rates. That equates into big differences in soil moisture. As we look to the eastern side of the state at, with the four inch fractional water index, we see numbers that are up close to saturation, which is one. As we move to the western side, we really see those numbers drop. We see those uh, bright yellows and then into the browns coming in showing us how dry that western area is. Here's Gary with a look at how that lack of rainfall has turned into increasing drought. Thanks Alan, good morning everyone. Well you're tired of it, I'm tired of it, but apparently Mother Nature's not tired of it. We're talking about of course the drought. So let's get right to the drought monitor map because it's not good news once again. So weeks, just a couple of weeks after getting rid of the extreme, that's that D3 or red area on the map, in southeast Oklahoma, we now have a big blob of that up in northwest Oklahoma, in Harper, Woods, Woodward, Ellis, uh, Beaver County, that area. Uh, those are the areas that are now um, well below normal, not only just from 90 days, but also up to 120 days. Well, the reason why? Well, it's pretty simple. If we look at these consecutive days maps from Elkhome Mesonet first, the consecutive days with uh, less than a tenth of, tenth of an inch of rainfall on any single day, uh, we're up to 101 days um, in the far western panhandle, uh, all the way up to uh, 95 days in far northwest Oklahoma, and then of course that drops down to um, 60 to 70 to 80 days as we get farther uh, east into I-35 territory. Um, and then some uh, rains across the eastern half of the state that didn't do enough to uh, alleviate drought, but at least it gave them some moisture. Our final map will be a look at the percentage of normal rainfall for the last 90 days. Um, but as you can see, for much of western Oklahoma, uh, we have a percentage of normal rainfall over that 90 day period of less than 10% of normal. In some cases, it's 0% normal, meaning they've gotten no precipitation over the last 90 days. Um, and the best areas we see up across northeast Oklahoma and southeast Oklahoma are merely 60-some percent of normal. So a really sad state of affairs uh, in the past 90 days across the state of Oklahoma. So it's the same message every week. We need, uh, we need precipitation, we need snow, we need rain, and yes, we'll take ice if we can get it at this point. We need the moisture that bad. Um, rain would be preferable, snow would be uh, uh, okay. Ice, uh, well, that's a pick your poison type of a, a thing, but we do need the moisture. So hopefully we'll get that uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Some big reports came out yesterday, some of the first of 2018, and Kim, let's dive into the WASD. What, what, what was in there? Well, there wasn't much uh, change expected in the WASD, either on wheat, corn, or beans, so just more of the same. As uh, we deviate from that, then, then we have some prices. If there's any price movement, it'll be Monday from, from the WASD report. I think uh, on that, uh, the, the world wheat stocks were expected to uh, decline just a little bit, but we've got massive stocks, and it's going to take some big changes to get some price movement. Now, another one of the big reports was the seedings report. Was there anything in that? Well, that seedings report on uh, hard red winter wheat and, and the winter wheat uh, plantings is expected to be down 8%. That's, oh, 30 million plus acres, the lowest uh, since uh, 1906. 
There's some chance that uh, it was going to go lower than that. And I think with these uh, lower planted acres and the big decline in the planted acres over the last five or six years, it puts more pressure on yields. And yields have been offsetting much of, much of that. I think I saw one report said 28% decline in, in acres, but you've had a relatively large increase in, in uh, yields, and so we haven't had that big a decline in production. So the wheat that is in the ground, some of it was, was, was planned for cattle, how, how, how does the pasture land look? Well, what producers are doing is they're deciding what to do with those cattle. Right. You know, do they keep them or will they graze them out? Right. I saw one report that uh, compared uh, graze out to harvest, and at 32, uh, 30, 32 bushels, it was uh, you know pretty straightforward to graze out some wheat. But once you got, if you can get up to 40 bushels, 45 bushels per acre, then it's leaning more towards uh, wheat. But we both know that the big determining factor is will we get some moisture and when will we get that moisture? Some, uh, a, another crop that people have been talking about is cotton. This, this last year was a bang up year when it came to cotton. Some producers are thinking about planting cotton. Is, this, is, is 2018 a good cotton year in your opinion? Well, let's get real here. A lot of producers are, have planted cotton right. in this last year or so and are looking at planted cotton. Cotton may be like grain sorghum last year. You know, everybody was concerned about that, uh, raising grain sorghum because of the aphid. Mm -hmm. uh, it turned out that uh, we didn't have that problem and producers that, that uh, planted the sorghum got a premium price for it because there was a shorter up. You know, an, uh, just an old thumb rule is if, if everybody and their dog's doing it, it might be time to look at something else. Mm -hmm. And when people are avoiding an area or not planting something, it might be time to go in and do it. So if, 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 if we were to look into the Kim Anderson patented crystal ball, what would be that magic crop for the summer to, to, to plant that nobody else is looking at? Well, I'd look at grain sorghum. Mm -hmm. I would probably go ahead and look at, if I was good at producing corn, I would go with corn. I'd, I would go, go with what I was comfortable raising. Price will take care of itself. Prices will come back up. Right. We, they're going to be like a thief in the night. We don't know when it's coming, but it will come. And if you don't have anything in the bin or anything in the field, you're not going to be able to take advantage of it. Speaking of something in the bin, there's bins all over this place with a lot of weed in it and across Oklahoma, the same thing. When, how, how, how solid is, is, the, is the price of wheat right now and, and, and what will it take to move that price? Okay, what it's going to take to move price as far as uh, stocks go, mm -hmm. it's going to take some big losses of uh, production in the former Soviet Union countries. Uh, Europe, Australia, Argentina. You know, we lost uh, Australia this year. We were lower production in the United States this year. We were lower production in Canada this year, and we didn't get the price movement. So we're going to have to lose some crops in the former Soviet Union area. But I think what's going to get our price up, at least to break even or above levels, is quality. Let's get back to test weight and protein. We've got to have a quality product that the millers want, and if we get that, then we will get back to $5 wheat. Uh, we've got the acres down. Uh, we, you know, we'll have the yield, but we've got to have quality. The the one thing that will take prices lower is low test weight and our low protein quality. That's what we got to have now, and that's the first thing we got to have to get prices higher. Okay, thank you much, Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University, and here's Brian Arnell to talk about how soil nutrition can be impacted by mobility of nutrients. When it comes to making fertilizer recommendations, one of the important factors that we consider on how we make recommendations is the mobility of a nutrient in the soil. Now, we have to start with the soil itself, not the nutrient, but the soil. So the soil itself has a net negative charge. So if the soil particle is right here, it has a negative charge to it. As we know, like charges repel, opposite charges attract. So in most cases, we can look at the charge of a nutrient, let's say ammonium, NH4, NH4, and it is a positive. So we will have this combination where the ammonium wants to sit on the soil particle because it is negative and opposites attract. So this is a positive cation being attracted to the negative soil. Now, I usually talk about nitrate as being the most mobile of all of our nutrients. Nitrate is NO3 negative. So we have a negatively charged. That's why 
they repel each other. So the soil particle and the nitrate particle repel each other and nitrate stays in water solution. So because it's in water solution, wherever the soil water goes up, down, sideways, nitrate will follow. And as long as the nitrogen is the mobile is in the ammonium form, it will stay on or near the soil particle for most cases. A mobile nutrient, if you have the plant roots right here, my pretty plant here coming up, we have the plant, there's the soil, we have our plant roots. A, a plant can access mobile nutrients from a large volume of soil. Everything that that plant can draw water from can reach it. So our nitrogen recommendations, our sulfur recommendations, uh, things like boron and others, we make a recommendation based upon yield needed because it is pulling a volume. Now on our immobile nutrients, uh, that would be like um, phosphorus, ammonium even, but we're going to focus on phosphorus, iron, manganese, and zinc, many of our metals. We're drawing from an area that is really just millimeters away from the root surface. And so that need, means we need a concentration of that nutrient in the soil. So on yield, we just need a total, or on our mobile nutrients, we just need a total, uh, total for the plant to use. But on our immobile nutrients, we need a concentration. So that's why for nitrogen, sulfur, and boron, it's a yield goal-based recommendation. And for things like phosphorus, iron, uh, manganese, and zinc, it's a concentration or a sufficiency. For more information about nutrient mobility, check out the SUNUP website at www.sunup.okstate.edu. Daryl Peel, our Livestock Marketing Specialist, is here with us now. And Daryl, it's a new year, so let's start off with how the cattle markets are looking as we start 2018. Well, we are, we're off to a pretty good start right now. Cattle markets are, are pretty strong. It's early in the year, and it takes a little while in January to kind of get a sense of where the markets are post-holiday. Um, but it looks good at this point. We carried a lot of nice momentum out of 2017, and that's, uh, you know, that's where we're starting 2018. So we're off to a good start so far. Let's talk about part of the demand and international trade and what the latest data shows about beef and meat trade in particular. Well, the re most recent data we have is for the month of November, um, and it showed a continuation of strong beef exports. They were up, but not as much over a, a relatively big number a year ago, about 3% higher in November. For the year to date, for the first 11 months of the year, beef exports are up about 13%. Uh, on the import side, imports were about the same as a year earlier for the month of November. Uh, for the year to date, down about 1%. So uh, again, we've had good strong performance there. That's helping demand and, and helping support these cattle markets. And then what about beef exports to China? You know, we talked a lot about China, very excited about getting access last year in the middle of 2017. Uh, it's a slow process. Uh, if you look at the numbers, we're watching them on a month-by-month -month basis, and you know you look at it a couple different ways. Uh, China was the number 10 beef export market in November, uh, but that was right ahead of the Philippines. So it's a very small percentage, uh, about eight tenths of one percent of our November exports went to China. Um, and for the year to date, it was about three percent or three tenths of one percent. So uh, it's it's a slow process. I think it will continue to grow. We're watching it every month. But I don't think China will probably be a major factor in U.S. beef markets in 2018. I think it's farther down the road than that. And finally, today, the situation for pasture in the Southern Plains, pretty dry, isn't it? It's very dry. Uh, it's been a real challenging year for wheat pasture. Um, you know, we had to wait later to plant a lot of the wheat to get past the army worms. By then it was dry. Some of the wheat is still very small, um, you know, barely up in some cases. In other cases it got up and maybe we grazed it a little bit. Or in some cases we couldn't even graze it because the root development was so poor that it would pull it out of the ground. So, and, and some of the cattle that were out earlier have already had to move off because we don't have any growth. It's dry and it's cold now, so we're not getting any growth for the time being. So all in all, a pretty disappointing year so far. Okay, Daryl, thanks a lot. We'll see you again soon. It won't be too long until the upcoming spring calving season begins, so now would be a good time to uh, revisit our plan of attack as we're working with those cows and heifers at calving time. And one of the uh, things that I think we want to consider before that first heifer needs some assistance is let's plan how long we're going to wait and watch her 
in the process of labor before we actually uh, get her up into the pen or the, the uh, calving area and do our examination. That's a question that often arises for cow-calf producers. How long do I watch before I actually uh, do some intervention and see if she needs help? Well, there's research that gives us uh, some guidelines to work with on that particular topic. The research was done in Miles City, Montana at the USDA station up the, in that neck of the woods, as well as here at Oklahoma State University. And uh, this was reported clear back in the 80s, but I think it's still applicable for uh, our cattle today. What they looked at was the length of what they called stage two of calving. Now let's define stage two. Stage two begins when we first see the appearance of the water bag or perhaps baby calf's feet coming out is the first thing we see. And stage two is over when that calf is completely delivered out on the ground. Well, how long is stage two? The Montana folks looked at both mature cows, cows that had had calves before, as well as two-year-old heifers having their first calves. In the case of the cows that had previously calved, the mature ones, the average length of time of stage two was only 22 minutes. I think that's shorter than most people would have uh, figured it to be. For those first calf heifers that had never had that uh, calving process before, the average length of time for those that were going to deliver that calf unassisted and end up with a healthy cow and a healthy calf, that length of time was around 55 minutes. Almost exactly the same as the amount of time that we observed here at Oklahoma State University uh, around 54 minutes. So I think the rule of thumb that we can use is that if we've got a mature cow that is in the throes of labor, we can watch her for a, a maximum of about a half of an hour. If she's not making some real progress, then we better expect that there's a problem, get her up, do our examination, and apply assistance if necessary. In the case of that two-year-old having her first calf, we want to watch her at least about an hour. If she's making real progress with each strain, then I would just continue to watch and let her deliver the calf unassisted. But if it looks like she's straining and nothing's happening, chances are there's a hip lock, perhaps the calf is coming backwards, uh, many different possibilities here that we need to get up and examine her and see what the situation is. One more reminder. You know, if you get her up and evaluate and decide this is a situation that I don't know how to take care of, call your local veterinarian as quickly as possible. Time is of the essence. We need to get that calf delivered as soon as possible. One more thing I'd like to remind you about, and that is take time to download our extension circular. It's uh, called Calving Time Management for Beef Cows and Heifers. It's E-1006. But you can simply go to the SUNUP website, that's sunup.okstate.edu, look under show links, and we'll have a link there to this particular circular. It has a lot of information about working with cows and heifers at calving time and helping you uh, end up with a higher percentage of live calves that eventually you can sell at weaning time. We hope that this will help you through this upcoming calving season, and we certainly look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow Calf Corner. Now back to the Extension Conference. It's a time of transition for the state agency in more ways than one. Today we're noting a distinguished career and looking to the future. Uh, I, I was fortunate when I was the Director of Cooperative Extension at Michigan State University, I served on the National Steering Committee. Dr. Trapp came on that a couple years after I joined it. And uh, so that's when I first got to know him. My, my first reactions were, wow, what a curmudgeon. I mean, this guy is, he's not gonna, he's not gonna accept anything that anyone says until he's kind of gone through the nth degree with it. But over the years, I began to realize that really what we were seeing was, again, his inquisitiveness, his analytical skills coming to bear on, well, what is the best thing to do? And as I got to know him, I began to realize what a sense of, of purpose he has in the mission of Cooperative Extension. So we became to be really good friends and, and respected each other as colleagues. He started out contributing a lot to teaching and research and I benefited from his leadership both as a department head 
and in his extension career. So I think he used his analytical skills to help think strategically about the path forward. I think he was a great steward of our resources. He's done a lot to help us celebrate our past and also to build for the future. Basically what you're here for is to help people and to use the resources that you have to do that. And I, that's an enjoyable kind of thing, very rewarding, I think, to, to the people in Extension and very beneficial to the state. But, you know, there comes a time to, uh, to pass the torch and to, uh, to do a few things. I'm looking forward to retirement. And uh, Dr. Joy has been an outstanding faculty member, Extension uh, faculty member, and a great farm management program, uh, developed a lot of new concepts. I think she'll do exactly the same thing in Extension and uh, certainly will uh, provide all the assistance and, and help to her that I can. Dr. Trapp's leaving big, big shoes to fill, so I'm excited about the opportunity to serve Extension in a new capacity. While I've enjoyed my career as an Extension Farm Management Specialist, this is a way to contribute in, in new and, and different ways, and so I'm looking forward to uh, building on that legacy. She's not a whole lot different from Dr. Trapp in, in several respects. One is she's very inquisitive, very analytical. She studies hard. She, she asks a lot of questions and tries to understand how is it working? Uh, why is it working this way? What are the issues? And then start looking for and how do we solve that? You can't find any better set of friends than what you find in, in the extension system and, and the dedication that they have and the work that they do. and. I'll miss Extension, but it's still going to be there and uh, I'm going to be one of the people using the services of Extension. Dr. Doy will begin her new role on February 1st. And that will do it for Sign Up this week. Remember, you can find us anytime on our website and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at Sun Up.